so we are continuing, and this is leading up to our Christmas service. And we're looking at the prophecies in the Old Testament concerning the birth of Christ and concerning his life, prophecies of, about his life that Jesus fulfilled in the Old Testament. It's all going to culminate on December 22nd for our Christmas service. And I just want to tell you, you don't want to miss that service. It's going to be an incredible service to come and worship our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so there's going to be things that kids are going to be doing. And anytime you have kids doing something for a Christmas service, you know it's going to be great. And so you guys come, invite your friends, invite your family, invite your coworkers. December 22nd will culminate our series for our Christmas service. Let's go before the Lord in prayer before I dive into God's word here. Lord, I thank you for this morning. Thank you for the privilege of preaching your word. Lord, I need your help. God, I can't communicate without you. Lord, I need your strength to be able to, to honor you and to speak your word with truth, with boldness, compassion. And God, I thank you for your people. Uh, I thank you that you have them here and that you're going to speak to their heart. God, as your word goes forth, I know that you're going to be faithful to honor your word and to, and to bless your people today. God, we thank you that you'll be with us the rest of this service. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So when you're thinking about um, families and, and, and churches and, and cities and our nation, when you're thinking about the the health of a family and, and the health of a church and, and the strength of a city and the strength of a nation, all of that has to do with leaders and leadership. When you trace, when you want to trace the destruction of a family, you want to trace the destruction of a church, of a city, of a nation, I believe it always comes back to leadership, comes back to leaders. Who are the leaders and how do they lead? And that's the core issue when you're thinking about how, is a, how our family is going to stay together, how our church is going to stay together and move forward with gospel proclamation, how, how, is our, how are, our, are the cities that we live in, how are they going to be vibrant and healthy and strong, how is our nation going to move forward in, in, in truth, a biblical convictions and biblical morality, how are we going to be a healthy nation? In all of those areas, all those realms of our life, leadership is so important. Do you believe that today? It's important that, that leaders, that men and women would be godly leaders. And I believe in our world today, I believe in our world today that we have a leadership deficit. I believe we have a leadership deficit. I, I, I believe we're in a leadership crisis in families, in marriages, in churches, in cities, in, in our nation, we are in leadership crisis in our nation today. And here's, the, here's, here's why I believe we're in, we have leadership crisis in, in many areas of our society today. I believe it's because that, that men and women today as leaders have abandoned biblical morality. They've abandoned biblical truth. Amen. They've abandoned it. And, they, and, they, and, and here's, 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 the, here's the idea of the day, that there really is no moral absolutes. We are progressively moving into a, into a direction in our country where there are no moral absolutes. And the leaders that are there in our country that are, are, are called to lead in, 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 in morality, called to lead in, with biblical convictions, they are falling prey to the trends of our culture and they're watering down the truth of God's word. They're not standing for truth and righteousness. And so the push of our culture today is that you have your truth you have what is true for you, and I have what is true for me, and we call it my truth. I have my truth, and you have your truth, and, and you, can't, you can't impose your truth onto me because I have my own definition of truth. And you know what? That really doesn't work in society. Societies break down from the inside out when there are no fixed moral absolutes. There have always been fixed moral, ab moral absolutes, and they come from God. They come from his word. He is our creator. And what happens is when you live in a pluralistic society where there's ideas uh, coming from all different directions and there's ideas about many different uh, ideas about who God is and many different views of morality, then, then, then what happens is, is that everyone just falls into this, it's like this current of this river. And everyone just kind of gets swept away and, and men live as they want to live and women live as they want to live and they push off restraint and as a result, families break down. Churches break down. Cities break down. And our nation breaks down. And it's connected with leadership. It's connected with leadership. Who is going to lead today in our culture? 
Who is going to lead today? When leaders are failing to lead as God has called them to, those under them are left without solid foundations to walk on. And that's, that's what I think about. I think about our children. I think about my kids. What is going to be defined as truth for my kids and my grandkids as they grow older in this life? What's going to be defined as right and wrong? E- eventually, there is no right and wrong. What's, what's considered now to be immoral is considered moral now and in the future generation. And that's the pattern. That's what happens. And I, I, I worry and I'm concerned for our kids because of a failure of leadership in our country. When leaders are failing to lead as God's called them to, our kids are going to suffer. And as we look into the Old Testament, as we look into the 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 story of of the nation of Israel. This is what we saw. We saw it last week. I talked last week a little bit about the nation of Israel and their pattern of worshiping God as the one true God. Jehovah God is the one true God. And then they would intermingle with pagan nations and they would adopt idolatry and worship false gods. And as a result, their standards of morality would would fall to to the wayside. And then they would become oppressed by foreign nations because they abandoned the one true God. They abandoned Jehovah God. And then the nations would overtake them. And then they would be in a place of distress. And then they would they'd cry out. They would repent. And God would restore and rescue. And that was the pattern. And we're going to look again today in, in the Old Testament to the prophet Micah. And we're going to see that the nation of Israel was in this, that, that same place. And the prophet Micah speaks to it. There was a leadership crisis in the nation of Israel. And we looked at it as a whole last week. But today we're going to read from the prophecy that God gave the prophet Micah. And the prophet Micah was sent by God to speak judgment, to declare judgment to the leaders of Israel. And the nation of Israel during the, prophet, during the, the time of the prophet Micah was a divided kingdom. There was the north and the south. There was, to the north there was Israel, and to the south there was Judah. And, and, and Micah the prophet lived in Judah, lived in the southern kingdom. But when you read the book of Micah, you read the prophecy of Micah, he speaks to both the northern and the southern kingdom. And he speaks a word of judgment and warning to the nation, but he speaks most, most clearly and pointedly to the leaders of the nation of Israel. It's all about leadership. What are the leaders going to do? Now, while, while all of us are responsible to obey the Lord, while all of us as children of God are responsible to follow the Lord, to obey him, To follow after his ways, leaders are held more accountable. Leaders are held to a stricter standard. That's what we see in the New Testament, James chapter 3. It says, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers. For you know that we who teach, we who are in leadership, we who have authority, we who teach, will be judged with greater strictness. And this is what we're going to see in this prophecy of Micah to the nation of Israel. Let's look at these sections here. Listen, listen to the rebuke of the leaders of Israel through the mouth of God's prophet Micah. Listen to this, chapter 2, just a little survey of Micah. Micah chapter 2, verses 1 through 2. Woe to those who devise wickedness and work evil on their beds. When the morning dawns, they perform it. So there's a picture here that these leaders, they're, they're laying down in their bed and they're thinking about ways that they can pervert justice, ways that they can take advantage of people they're called to lead. And when the morning dawns, they get after it, they perform it because it, because it is in the power of their hand. They have the power to do it. They're leaders. They covet fields and they seize them and houses and they take them away. Because Why? Because it's in the power of their hands to do it. They've been given positions of leadership. They oppress a man in his house, a man in his inheritance. The prophet is saying to, that the leaders of Israel were using their positions of leadership to take advantage of the people they were called to lead and to shepherd. The leaders of Israel were taking advantage of their position and their authority for their own interest. When what were they called to do? They were called to take care of the people that God had placed under them to lead. They were called to shepherd them, to care for them, to lead them. In chapter 3, the prophet describes this self-centered leadership in a very vivid and shocking way. This is very vivid and very shocking, so I just warn you, the language is used here. It's just drawing to our mind when we read it. Listen to Micah chapter 3. And I said, hear you heads of Jacob and the rulers of the house of Israel, 
is it not for you to know justice? He says, aren't you the ones, aren't you to know justice, but you are taking advantage and walking in injustice with my people. Is it not for you to know justice? You who hate the good and love the evil, who tear the skin from off my people and their flesh from off their bones, who eat the flesh of my people and flay their skin from off them and break their bones in pieces and chop them up like meat in a pot, like flesh in a cauldron. I was cooking in a cast iron skillet the other day and that's what I thought of when I read this, a big five gallon, 10 gallon pot. What's the prophet saying to the leaders of Israel with that jarring picture there? God is saying to the leaders of Israel, you are called to protect and lead and serve my people, but instead your exploitation of my people is like you would be skinning them alive and cooking them in a pot. That's how he's describing their expo- the exploitation of the people by the leaders of Israel. Complete rejection of love and care for the people of God. And then the prophet says, continuing in chapter three, that Israel, because of the failure of its shepherds, shall be left in a heap of ruins. Listen to this. Hear you, you heads of the house of Jacob and the rulers of the house of Israel who detest justice and make crooked all that is straight, who build Zion with blood and Jerusalem with iniquity. Its heads give judgment for a bribe. Its priests teach for a price. Its prophets practice divination for money. Yet they lean on the Lord and say, is not the Lord in the midst of us? No disaster shall come upon us. They're, They're deceived. Zion shall be plowed as a field and Jerusalem shall become a heap of ruins. That's where people are left when leaders abandon God. That's where God's people are left. That's where families are left. When families end up in in a heap of ruins, it's because a man or a woman have failed to continue to pursue righteousness and godliness in their marriage and in their family. When cities are destroyed and nations are destroyed from the inside out, it's because leaders have become self-serving to meet their own needs, and and they forget that that when you're called to lead, you're called to serve those that God has placed under you. And so this this prophecy is jarring. This prophecy really, you look at it and you think, wow, these men are so wicked, and where is the hope? Where is the hope? Where, 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 Where will the leader rise up that will shepherd the people of God? Where are the leaders at? And that's what I would ask. Where are the leaders at? Leaders for our family, for our churches, for our city, for our nation, where are the leaders gonna come from? And my prayer is that God would raise up more men and women that would lead with conviction, with biblical morality. With this as the backdrop, the prophet of God points to a true leader after God's own heart. An eternal king, an eternal leader who will be born in Bethlehem. A king who will lead God's people back to his ways. A king who will lead as a true shepherd who will care for his people, who will lay down his life for his people. And he says it in Micah chapter five. He rebukes the leaders in chapter one, two, and three, and four. And then he gets to chapter five and listen to the prophecy. Micah five, verse two. But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. So who is that? Who is that? Who's the leader that's gonna come from of old, from ancient days, from eternity past? Who is the leader? Who was the ruler who was to come from old? Matthew chapter two tells us who came. Matthew chapter two tells us who fulfilled this prophecy from the prophet Micah. Look at Matthew chapter two verse one through six. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them. So the chief priests and the scribes, he went to those who knew the law of God. He went to those who knew the law of God, King Herod did. And he said, he inquired of them, where is the Messiah, the Christ, to be born? And they went to Micah. 
And they told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for it is written by the prophet, pointing back to Micah 5, 2. And listen, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler. And Matthew adds a fuller picture here, who will shepherd my people, Israel. And Jesus fulfilled the prophecy of Micah hundreds and hundreds of years before he was born in Bethlehem, before he was born in that manger. So you can say, well, that's just happenstance. But I want you to know, you had no control over where you were born. You can't control where you're born. You're born wherever your parents decide to have you. I was born at Lady of the City Hospital in Galliano, Louisiana. Right, Mom? Yeah, that's where I was born, Bayou Lafouche. I couldn't control that. Jesus couldn't control that. Why? Because we, we, it's out of our power. This is a divine move of God. This is the incarnation. This is God becoming man. And this is God becoming flesh and fulfilling the law and the prophets as we sang in that song, King of Kings. Jesus fulfilled the prophecies. He was born in Bethlehem. He was the, born to be the king of the Jews. And it's interesting that the city Bethlehem has the meaning It means house of bread, house of bread. And so when Matthew says that he will be a shepherd to his people Israel, what he's saying there is this picture of sustenance and and being fed, that Jesus is going to be the one that feeds his people, not like the leaders in Micah, not like the leaders that Micah rebuked through his prophecy, not like those leaders who are trying to get all that they can from the people to take advantage of them, to manipulate them, to control them for their own ends. Jesus is going to come as the true shepherd king, and he's going to come to feed them with true spiritual food, to bring, to bring access to eternal life where he would ultimately provide that through the cross and his resurrection, the house of bread. Jesus will be a true shepherd of his people. Unlike the leaders of Israel who perverted justice, who exploited people for their own benefit, Jesus would come not to be served, but to serve and to give his life. Jesus is the king of all kings who reigns with total authority and power. We looked at that last week. There's nobody greater than him, nobody higher than him, no one with more power than Jesus. Why? Because he is eternal God. He's the God-man. He reigns with total authority and power. He will judge the earth in the consummation of the age. But when he came to the earth, how did he come? He came humbly as a baby born in a manger. He didn't come as a conquering ruler, which that's who the Jews were looking for. He didn't come as a conquering ruler. He came as a lowly servant. He came and demonstrated what true power and authority look like on earth. We talked about that last week, how leaders nowadays, they try to flex their power to demonstrate their authority and their power, to demonstrate that they have authority by ruling over people with, with, with an iron fist. But Jesus didn't come like that. He could have. Why? Because he was God. But how did he come? Philippians 2 tells us, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But what did Jesus do? He emptied himself of his divine privileges. He emptied himself of of his divine rights as God. He emptied himself by taking the form of a servant and and being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. And through death, through his death on the cross, he served humanity in a way that no leader has ever served humanity. He made a way for man to be reconciled to a holy God. This is our shepherd king. So who is our shepherd king? How does he lead his people? How does he love us? How does he shepherd us? The king born in Bethlehem, the house of bread, how does he feed us as his people? So here's what I want to do. I want us to look at three attributes of our shepherd king here this morning. Three ways in which we see Jesus described, our shepherd king described in scripture. Three ways that we would say that that this is who our shepherd king is. This is how he loves us as his sheep. The first one is this, that our shepherd king provides all that we need. Our shepherd king provides all that we need. Do you believe that? Provides all that we need. Sometimes I think we get confused, our needs and our wants and our desires. But our shepherd king provides all that we need. He's there. He sustains us. He strengthens us. You know, one of the greatest psalms that describes 
Jesus as our shepherd, or describes God as our shepherd, is Psalm 23. It's one of the greatest uh, uh, psalms, one of the greatest chapters in all of Scripture, describing God as our shepherd. It's a beautiful section there. What I want to do, I just want to walk through it just for a second here. Psalm 23 speaks to the reality that as the sheep of the Lord's fold, we are cared for in every season of our life. Why? Because he's our shepherd. He's our shepherd. Our shepherd king provides all that we need. Look and listen to Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. He's my shepherd. I shall not want. He's not taking advantage of me like narcissistic leaders do. He's my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Isn't that beautiful language there? I shall not want. He, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He feeds me. He sustains me. He's Jesus born in Bethlehem, the house of bread. He comes to feed and provide. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Our shepherd king cares about our needs, our physical needs as well as our, our spiritual needs, the, the needs of our soul. He gives us rest for our weary hearts. When we are filled with anxiety about daily provisions, when we are filled with anxiety about the future, when we are worried about situations that seem too big to handle, our shepherd king, what does he do? He leads us by still waters. He restores our soul. Has your soul been troubled lately? Your shepherd king provides all that you need. Your shepherd king provides all that you need. Have you been worried about daily provisions? You've been worried about how you're going to buy Christmas gifts this year. You've been worried about how you're going to pay the bills, something even more important. Have you been worried about, about, about your job, about your family, about your marriage, about your children? Have your children been going in different directions that are concerning you? Have you been worried? Have you been filled with anxiety? Is your soul troubled today? Your shepherd king provides all that you need. He leads you by still waters. He restores your soul. He makes us lie down in green pastures. Sometimes the Lord's got to make us do things, right? To remind us, hey, my way is better than your way. You're trying to strive in your own strength to make things happen, and you're weary in your heart today because you've been trying to strive to, to make things happen, to change things, to change your circumstances, and you just need to stop. And you need to allow the Lord to make you lie down, to rest, to say, Lord, I, I, I give up. <laughs> I give up. I don't know what to do with this worry anymore, Lord. I don't know what to do with this anxiety anymore, Lord. I give up. I'll, yes, Lord, I'll lie down. You don't got to make me this time. And please, Lord, lead me by still waters. Because sometimes our life, we're not by still waters. We're by raging rivers that are overwhelming and trying to, try, trying to, trying to, trying to push us along and trying to overwhelm us and overtake us. The, but our good shepherd leads us by still waters. He restores our soul. Let's continue on. Psalm 23, our shepherd king provides all that we need. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I love that. I love this imagery of the valley of the shadow of death. And this is what I thought of. He says, I will fear no evil even though I'm in the valley of of the shadow of death. I'm in a valley. I'm in circumstances that are difficult. I'm in a valley, but there's a shadow of death over my life right now. And the shadow is overwhelming. And even though I will not fear, even though I'm in a valley and there's situations that are like dark shadows over me, I will not fear. Why? Because the Lord is with me. That's powerful. We don't fear because the Lord is with me even when the shadows are overwhelming. Because of our shepherd's constant care, we don't have to live in fear. Because he is with us even when we are going through situations that are casting large shadows over our life, we don't have to fear. Why? Because he's with us. Scripture says that the Lord is near to the brokenhearted. That's where he's at. He's near to those that are oppressed and overwhelmed. Those that are living under big shadows in their life of fear and worry and anxiety, he is with you. He is with you. Our shepherd king goes before us, prepares the way. 
He is at work even when the shadows are preventing us from seeing him. Even when the shadows are preventing you from seeing God, he is your good shepherd. Our shepherd king provides all that we need. Verse five, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy, I love this, shall follow me all the days of my life for I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is so good right here. I love this imagery right here. Goodness and mercy are gonna do what in my life? Because I have a shepherd king, a good shepherd that provides all that I need. What's gonna follow me? Goodness and mercy. I love this picture, that this is what happens because of the goodness of our shepherd king in our life. There will be a trail of goodness and mercy behind us. And what is that trail of goodness and mercy behind us gonna do? It's gonna remind us every time that God proved himself faithful. We're gonna walk on in our life. And when we're under the shadow of death, when we're overwhelmed and filled with fear, God reminds us through his word time and time again that he's with us. He doesn't leave us or forsake us. He provides for us and, and we look back over our life and there's a trail of goodness and mercy behind us. And we think, oh God, you're so good. My good shepherd provides all that I need. He's been so faithful. He's been so good. And so for some of you today, you know what you need to do? You need to quit looking ahead of you and all the things that are too big for you to handle. Look back. Turn around. Look at the goodness and mercy of God in your life. Where would you be? Some of you, some of you, you would not even be here. In a church? Right? In a church worshiping, worshiping with people? You used to think of people like, like us. They're crazy people. They raise their hands. They sing the songs. Those are crazy people, but but you're here. Why? Because the Holy Spirit awakened you through the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He redeemed you. He restored you. He gave you new life. Look back. Remember the trail of goodness and mercy. Amen? All the days. And I love the end there. I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. All the days of my life, our shepherd king will be faithful. He will not fall asleep on the job. That's what the Lord, that's what the Bible says in Psalms 121 about, about our God. I will lift my eyes to the mountains. Some translations say, is that where my help comes from? No. My help comes from who? The Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let my foot, your foot slip. He who watches over you, your good shepherd, your shepherd king, he's tending his sheep, he's watching over his sheep. He who watches you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. Amen. Our shepherd king provides all that we need. We see that in Psalm 23. What's the next thing that we see? Who is our shepherd king? Who is this shepherd? Who is this leader of Israel? Who is this leader of, of, of those who have surrendered to him? Who is this leader? Number two, our shepherd king protects us from the evil one. So you get into the New Testament, and here's another picture of our shepherd, John 10. Jesus declares himself as the good shepherd. He says, I'm the good shepherd. Listen to this contrast here between those who are good shepherds and those who are not. Jesus says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, steal, kill, and destroy. The good shepherd, I have come, I came, that they may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for for the sheep. He who is a hired hand, speaking back to the the leaders of, of Israel as we read through Micah, he who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, he does not own the sheep. And when he sees the wolf coming and leads and leaves the sheep and flees. So when a false leader who doesn't care about anything but himself, when he sees danger coming, what does he do? I'm getting out of Dodge. That's a big wolf with some big teeth in there. I don't want anything to do with that. He leaves. Why? Because the the sheep are not in his heart. He's not a true leader. But our shepherd king, he protects us from the evil one. The wolf snatches and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. He says, I, Jesus, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life. I I don't run when there's danger in your life. I've provided for you to have safety in your life. Our good shepherd protects us from the evil one. So let's think about this. Here's here's what I want to think, here's how I want us to think about how 
the Lord protects us from the, from, the, from the evil one. How does he protect us from Satan and his lies? What is the biggest objective that Satan has in our life? What is he trying to do? He's trying to get us to believe lies. If you go back to Genesis, that's where, that's where you see. If you want to see the beginning strategy of Satan in, as he interacts with God's created beings, human beings, his first strategy is to lie. And so one of the greatest ways that, that our Lord, our good shepherd, protects us from the evil one is that he gives us truth. He gives us truth. He gives us his word. This is one of the greatest protections from evil in your life. And as you're going on in your life and the enemy wants to lie to you and tell you that if you will, if you will prioritize these things in your life, this is how you're going to have a good life. Pursue money. Pursue a great career to make all kind of money. Don't have a lot of kids because kids are, are a bother. And, 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 and he's putting out these lies and these messages. Go this route. Connect with these people. Go this direction in your life. And he's pointing you. The enemy points you away from the truth of God's word. And so when you take that path and you abandon the protection of God's word, then you're susceptible to the evil one in his ways. So one of the great ways that the Lord protects us is through his word. Listen to Psalms 119. The psalmist says, oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. Your commands are always with me and make me wiser than my enemies. I have more insight than all my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes and all your kids. You should, you should quote Psalm 119 to your teacher tomorrow. <laughs> I have more insight than all my teachers. I'd be careful doing that, though. I have more understanding than the elders. Why? because I obey your precepts. I have kept my feet from every evil path so that I may obey your word. When you obey the word of God, you're kept from every evil path. I have not departed from your laws, for you yourself have taught me how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than the honey to my mouth. I gain understanding from your precepts, from your word, from your law. Therefore, I hate every wrong path. And this is a famous one right here. Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light for my path. How are we protected from the evil one and his strategy and his lies? You get into God's word. You prioritize God's word. You live according to God's word and according to God's truth. And what does the word of God do? It shines light in front of you. It is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I, if I will obey God's word, it's like a light, a bright light shining in front of me. And I know, okay, yes. No, I can't have that, friend, because the light of God's word shines and makes it clear. That, that, that's not a good friend for me, so I go this direction instead of that direction. No, no, I, I can't marry that person. Why? Because God's word says that you should not be unequally yoked, that a, a believer should not marry a non-believer, right? So the, the word of God, his word lights your path in front of you. It's protection from the evil one. You know, another way that the Lord protects us from the evil one, it's all centered around God's word, but, but also God gives the good shepherd gives to his people under shepherds to teach God's word, to protect the church from the lives of the enemy. Listen to Acts chapter 20. This is a call to the Ephesian elders, to the Ephesian pastors as they're pastoring the church in Ephesus. Listen to this, a call to the pastors. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. That's scripture right there. That's powerful. You don't belong to me. Uh, you, you'll very rarely ever hear me, hear me say, this is, you know, come visit my church or, or these are my people. I, I kind of like shudder when I hear people say that. They say, you know, this is your church, you know, do what you want with your church, Ben, or this is your church, Ben. I'm like, oh my goodness, I didn't pay for you with my blood. Who paid for you with his blood? Jesus did. And Jesus paid the price for your salvation. And, and as you surrender to him and you're a child of God and you're his sheep, you know what he does? He says, Ben, and all the other pastors here on staff, he says, here's my, here's my, here's my sheep. You take care of them. And just to make, take the stakes even higher, you need to be reminded that I paid for them with my blood. That's how much I love them. And that's how much you have to take care of them. And that is why I preach truth. That's why we preach the word of God. Why? Because there's wolves that are coming in to our culture. The things you watch on YouTube, the things you listen to on social media, the messages you hear all around you. You need shepherds that will 
light the path of God's word in front of you. Verse 28, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, into the church, not sparing the flock. Same imagery as we read in, in, in John 10. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw them away, to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, speaking to us as leaders, as pastors, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease day or night to admonish everyone with tears. It matters. You matter. Because you're God's children. And our, chief, our good shepherd, he protects you through the power of his word. He protects you from the evil one through the power of his word. And he does it through your daily taking in of God's word. And he does it through the preaching of God's word here on Sundays and on Wednesdays and in your D groups. That's how he does it. That's our shepherd king. Our shepherd king, he knows all that we need. He provides all that we need and he protects us from the evil one. And lastly, our shepherd king seeks the one who is lost. Our shepherd king seeks the one who is lost. You know, Jesus, Jesus would do things that infuriated the scribes and the Pharisees. He would do things that infuriated the religious people of his day, the religious leaders of the Jews. And one of the things that infuriated him the most was that Jesus would eat with sinners. Like it just, they, they couldn't handle that. Because in their worldview, as an Orthodox Jew, as a Jew that was seeking to abide by the law of God and be religiously right and pleasing to the Lord, you could not associate with those who were not Jewish and especially those who were sinners. You couldn't associate with them. Because by association, you'd be dragged, the idea you'd be dragged into their uncleanness. And Jesus comes on the scene, and he's a teacher. He's a rabbi. He knows the law and the prophets, and he speaks with authority as no one has ever spoken. He did miracles and signs and wonders, and, and that should have been enough, right? Should have been enough when he raised Lazarus from the dead. It should have been enough when he heal, healed the man born blind. It should have been enough. All the miracles should have been enough, but, but it wasn't enough for the scribes and Pharisees. Why? Because he ate with sinners, and they said, there's no way he can be from God because he eats with sinners. He eats with tax collectors and sinners. And for the Jews, the tax collector was the worst of the worst of sinners. They said, there's no way he's from God because nobody from God would associate with those that are unclean. And in Luke chapter 15, there's three stories that we're going to look at. Luke 15, and Jesus has one point to this story. And the point is this, is that the good shepherd he goes after the one who is lost. The good shepherd came for those who were sick. The good shepherd came for those that, don't, that, 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 that need salvation, those that understand the depth of their need. Listen to Luke 15, 1 through 2. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to Jesus, near to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. So you don't forget this context, Okay. If you want to understand the rest of these parables, Jesus is going to tell. These are parables, these are made-up stories to, to make a point to the scribes and Pharisees. Don't forget that. These stories, parables that I'm going to read, I'm going to talk about, are trying to communicate. He's trying to communicate something to the scribes and Pharisees. Why? Because they were grumbling amongst themselves about Jesus eating with sinners. So Jesus tells them. So he told them this parable, Luke 15, verse 3. What man of you? Having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does, does, does not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he's found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Amen? What is Jesus trying to tell the scribes and Pharisees there? He's trying to tell them, look, you're in the house. You're God's child. You love God and his law. These are not in the house. These are lost. These are sinners. I didn't, I, I came. I came for the lost. I came for the sinners. I didn't came for, come for those that are well. 
And, and, you know, ultimately what he's trying to tell the scribes and the Pharisees, ultimately, is that they're lost. And that they're missing the point. And they're not acknowledging him as the Messiah and the Savior. And he's exposing their hypocrisy. And the next parable he tells is the parable of the lost coins. So you have the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and it culminates in the most famous one, the parable of the prodigal son, the lost son. Lost sheep, lost coin, and lost son. Same message, same story, same way Jesus is trying to, to illustrate, the same point to the Pharisees. So let me tell you the story of the prodigal son, the parable of the prodigal son. Jesus says there was a man who had two sons, a young one and, a, and an older one. And then the younger son came to the father and said, Father, give me my inheritance now. So you know what the younger son was actually telling the father? He was telling the father that, that you're, it's, you'd be better off than dead. You'd be better off dead for me. Like, I want you dead. Because when do you get an inheritance? When someone dies. So this son in this story, comes to the father and says, I don't, I don't love you enough that you'd be alive. I want what comes to me when you die, so give it to me now. My inheritance is more important. You, they, they, what you give me is more important than you. So what does the father do in the story? He divides the inheritance and gives it, splits it between the younger son and the older son. So what does the younger son do? The younger son goes off into a far country he goes off and, and he spends his money, it says, in, in riotous living. So I don't know what riotous living looks, looks like, but I know it's not good, right? He's, he's, he's living like the pagans all around him, and he's, he's, he's wasting his money, and he's living with harlots and prostitutes, and, and, he, and, he's, and, and you could picture any type of riotous living. He's probably gambling, and he's, he's wasting his money, and he's drinking it away, and he's wasting his inheritance, and he's living for himself. And then he goes broke, which is what happens when you live riotous, when you live in a riotous way, right? He went broke. And he ends up at the lowest point of his life. He ends up, and this is such an interesting detail. Listen, he ends up so desperate and so destitute that he's so hungry, he's starving, and he's he became a servant to somebody to, to help feed and pigs and clean the pig stalls. And he's so hungry. That, that he is even willing to eat the food from the pigs. Now let's stop for a second. Think about this. Who is Jesus telling this parable to? He's telling it to scribes and Pharisees who are religious Jews. Think about that. This is the worst of the worst type of sinner that he's describing to them because pigs were unclean, right? So he's describing this person who doesn't want his father alive, would rather him dead. He's describing this person that is disrespectful to the authority of his father and rejects his love and care for him. He's describing not only that, but a man that is sexually immoral, wastes all of his inheritance, and then to top it all off, the icing on the cake, he is a man that is living with pigs and is willing to eat the pig slop. In the mind of those scribes and Pharisees, this is the lowest of the low. This is worse than the tax collector the worst sinner possible. Jesus is describing the worst sinner possible. And then the story goes, while he's about to eat the food, he was tempted to eat the food, he came to himself and he thought, my father is good. And even the hired servants in my father's house, they eat good. Even the slaves eat good and are taken care of. And here I am in the pig slop. He comes to himself and he starts the journey home. You know, and that's where it starts, right there. I don't care how low you've been or where you find yourself and what you are tempted to stoop low down to do. It starts, just make your way home. Make your way towards where you know God is. Make your way towards Christ. Make your way towards your Father. And that's what he did. He came to his senses and he made his way. He started heading home. And then this is what he did. He started working over in his mind. His repentant speech starts going over. This is what I'm going to say. And he had it all worked out as he's on the road home. And it says that the father was waiting and looking as he's looking down the road. And I just kind of believe this. This is just hypothetical here. It's, it's a made-up story, so I'm going to make up some more hypothetical situations. I just think, because I know who I am as a father, 
And I'd be looking down that road every day. Maybe today's the day. Maybe today's the moment my son's going to come. And that day was the day. And the, while the boy is preparing his speech, the father sees him and he runs to meet the father. He runs to meet the son. He runs to meet the son. You know, it was shameful for a Jewish man to run in public, right? Because they're a picture of dignity, a picture of honor and wealth. But the father took all that shame that he would have received in society. And he didn't care because his son was full of shame, hanging his head, preparing his, his repentant speech. And this is what he said, I, I'm, I'm going to run. I'm going to go. And you know what happened in that moment? It was a great exchange. The shame of the son became the shame of the father. And that's a picture of the, of the, of the gospel. Christ took our shame upon himself. And what does it say in Luke 15? And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, felt compassion, and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe, put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Restore his position of dignity in this family. The signet ring would have represented his authority, would have had the name, the, the, the family crest on that ring. He could, he could now buy under the authority of his father's name, put shoes on his feet. His purposes are restored in this life. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. This is the calf that they would they'd fatten up a, a month after month and, 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 and get it ready for a celebration to eat and celebrate. He said, take the fatted calf. We're going to kill it now. We're going to celebrate. Let us eat and celebrate. For this, my son was dead and is alive again. And he was lost and is found. And they begin to celebrate. Our shepherd king seeks after those that are lost. That's who our good shepherd is. So I don't know where you are today. I don't know what you've been through in your life and what burdens you're carrying. You need to be reminded today that your shepherd king, our shepherd king, he meets all of our needs. Our shepherd king protects us from the evil one through the power of his word. And our shepherd king, he seeks after you when you're at your lowest point, when you're overwhelmed. And this is the shepherd king that was prophesied through the prophet Micah that he would come. And he came over 2,000 years ago and he was born in that manger and he's still doing the same things today. He's providing for our needs. He's protecting us from error. And he is seeking us when we're lost. Amen? So, come as you are. Come as you are. Jesus, the King of all kings, the Lord of all lords, is the good shepherd. He's calling you today to lay down your burdens. He's calling you today to lie down in green pastures. He's leading you beside still waters. He's calling you today to come experience the protection of his love. The ruler from ancient days as prophesied in Micah chapter 5 is here today. He is the shepherd of Israel. And he will shepherd all of those who will come and lay down their burdens at his feet. Amen. Do you stand your feet with me this morning? So that's what I want us to do today. I want to open up these altars, open up this space up here. We're going to sing a song, Come As You Are. And you just come, wherever you are, whatever you're going through, come and bring your burdens to the Lord. If you, if you have burdens that are overwhelming you today, you come lay them down at the feet of Jesus. If you've never surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, You've never, you've never, you never encountered him as your shepherd king. Come, lay down your burdens, lay down your sins. Just like the prodigal son, come, lay down, whatever it is, come lay down your burdens. We're going to sing this song and you come. And that's how we're going to end. Sorrow, the heaven can't heal. Earth has no sorrow.